Hello everyone, I'm your presenter Ali Kundi, and I will be teaching you uh, the webinar of F4 English Law System. As you people have heard that English Law or F4 is an easy subject, we have heard it from many students who have passed it. But what my opinion about it, it is an easy subject, but at the same time, it's a technical subject as well. Because you have studied nothing related to F4 in the previous subjects like F1, F2, F3, or even if you are from MA1, FA1 background, there's no topics related to the business law. So it's a totally new subject in ACCA in which we have to get the knowledge of all the laws and regulations that can help us when we are accountant or when we will be working in an organization obviously when we will go to the organization there will be a contract between us and the employer that contract will state that uh, what will be our duties in the organization how much our remuneration will be how uh, much the rem will be our remuneration how much we will be paid and benefits each and every time. now how can we exercise each element that are presented in the contract whether we will be getting that whether we will not be getting that these are some things that we can only know about while we know about the contracts law or we know about the other law that can help us while working in the organizations. So we will be looking at different chapters and my more emphasis will be on the practice. The more practice we will do, the more technical areas, the more technical aspects of this subject that can help us pass this subject i'll be telling you all about it and we will be starting from the first chapter english legal system i have divided different chapters on different days of the webinar but basically we will, it will be divided on the basis of the chapters and uh, we will be looking at every chapter in detail along with their questions our more emphasis will be on the technical side of these chapters also on the practice as well Before starting, we should first look at the uh, pattern of the paper, how the paper comes in the exam, whenever you will be att attempting the F4 exam. Either it will be in form of, uh, you can attempt the paper in form of CBs that you have the option to attempt in form of central based examination, or you can also give this paper uh, manually if you want that it should be tested in the exam areas, exam centers. So I will be discussing the uh, pattern of the paper. As we know, there are two sections in F4. The first section comprised of 30, 45 MCQs that are equal 70 marks. Out of those 45 MCQs, 25 MCQs consist of two mark each, and 20 MCQ consist of one mark each, both equals to 70 marks. And on the other side, the second section is about the MTQs. And the second section and the section second section will be about the MTQs, multiple type questions, in which there will be a scenario given. And from that scenario could be asked five questions or ten questions, depending on the scenario. So we will be looking at all the practice materials. We will be looking at all the sections. We will be looking at all the technical areas in this webinar so that you people can understand the law for business law and it can help you pass this exam easily. We will start from chapter one. That is English legal system. I will be over going through uh, all the contents of this chapter. Majority of the contents of this chapter that I feel that which are important and then we will be attempting their questions so that you should know how the examiner asks the questions about such topics and how you are tested on what technical areas you are tested what are the things that you should know while answering the questions because in such papers in theoretical papers whenever there are mcqs the more problem is there are different statements and more of the statements look the same there are two statements two, both of the statements look the same kind and you are confused which statement to select, which statement to will be the correct one. So these are some technicalities this paper has. 
that you can answer them easily if you have the sound knowledge of this paper. So we will be looking at all of the these of, of the contents of this paper also, and then we will be looking at different MCQs and different questions that can help you pass this exam. So chapter number one is English legal system. English legal system is all about what because as we are studying ACCA, ACCA is the program of UK and everything related to UK is basically English. So basically whenever you will be studying uh, different subjects that will be related to that country. So as we you, every one inducted here is from ACCA background. So the English system you will be legal system that you should know about is also English legal system. So English legal system is the basic legal system that is being followed in the UK. So first, if we go look at the law and the definitions of law. So in easy words, if I want to define the law, these are principles and regulations established in a community by some authority. There is always some authority that is preparing the law in a country. For UK, it might be parliament. It might be delegated legislation that we will study in detail in the future in this chapter ahead. So. When coming to the definition of the law, these are principles and regulations established in the community by some authority and applicable to its people, whether in the form of legislation or of custom and policies recognized and enforced by judicial decisions. So basically, ACC the law, if you talk about the law, these are principles and regulations that are established in the community. Established in the community, it is always prepared for people living in a community. Law is always prepared for the people living in a country or living in a community. They can be in form of legislation or they can be in form of customer policies and they are being followed or enforced by judicial decisions. So if someone follows the law, it's good for them. If someone does not follow the law, it, they can be uh, the judiciary come in that uh, in that area you couldn't be taken to the courts and that judiciary take the decision that you haven't followed the law and this is the verdict this is the remedies you have to pay so basically all of the law all of the legal principles all of the legislation that are being recognized and enforced and uh, recognized in a country implemented by authority for the people living in a community they are all enforced by a judicial decision coming to the types of law First of all, the very first law that was introduced in UK was common law. Okay. Common law was introduced after the Norman conquest. And after the Norman conquest, the English law has been described as a common law system. This was a system where a number of legal concepts from normal law in, were incorporated into the English system. So basically, the normals when conquered the UK after their conquest, the first law they introduced in UK was a common law. And the main purpose of their law for uh, and the system where number of legal uh, concepts from normal law were incorporated into the English system, they were different concepts from normans that were introduced into the English system, though they were also following their own system as well, because it was a mix developed from local customs. So if you talk about common law, it was developed from local customs, introduced the system of precedence. We will be studying precedence in detail. Precedence in a, is a system where judges follow previous cases, previous decisions to come to conclusions in their current cases. So in common law, the only remedy available was damages. At that time, the only remedy available was damages, but in future, other remedies of common law were also introduced. And common law was rigid and inflexible so common law was rigid and inflexible because there was uh, uh, as it was developed from local customs as they was the there were number of concepts that were introduced from normal laws as well into common law so it was very diff difficult for people to implement it on themselves and the way of testing the way of uh, giving the verdicts in common law was very rigid and inflexible as well so because of this rigidity because of this inflexibility there were many consequences that were being faced by the public in common law
<clears throat> and to deal with these issues and damages and to deal with these problems equity was introduced as common law was rigid as common law was inflexible there were many different kind of consequences there were different decisions that were being taken that were harsh for the public that were not suitable for the public or that were not on the basis of what public expected because of the rigidity and inflexibility so deal with this rigidity and and inflexibility another system was introduced which was known as equity and a main purpose of the equity was to uh, give uh, fair treatment fairness to the people who have just faced the harsh consequences of the common law so deal with the issues and damages are not always suitable remedy because everything the only remedy in common law was rem uh, damages and as they say that for every harsh consequence you cannot always reward a remedy so equity was developed after the common law to introduce fairness into the english legal system so if we talk about the equity equity was developed as a petition by a party who felt that common law had led to injustice where every party any party who felt that common law has done injustice with them they would always go to the equity for equal and fair treatment it is more flexible than the common law it was more flexible as in common law there was only one remedy remedy available that was damages also in common law the judges won't go into the detail they just would hear from the party what has been done and they will look at the precedents what are the verdicts that are given when something like this is done and they would give the, give the same precedent they would not look at the scenario or they would not look in detail what caused this thing caused the the party to do this or to perform this act so it is more flexible than common law because there were more remedies and available in it also they were every party was asked in detail what was the scenario in which they performed the, such actions or such act next into introduce new discretionary remedies as i said the, there were other remedies in equity as well with common law there was only one remedy that was damages but with equity some other remedies was were also introduced those were uh, injunction specific performance rescission that we will be starting in detail in chapter number 2 also equity the main reason of uh, implementing equity or introducing equity was fairness and therefore will, will not be granted if there is undue delay in bringing the case for example if a party has acted unfairly and they think that equity can still give them justice or still give them a way out equity was not for such people equity is only for those people who thought that common law has done injustice with them so if you have done something illegal if you have done something illegal and common law has given the, you the right punishment you cannot go to equity and tell them to just finish your punishment because according to them they think that it was illegal but actually it wasn't illegal so if you have done something illegal and common law has given you the right punishment or right remedy then you cannot go to equity because equity is always related to equity is just concerned with fairness and therefore it will not be granted if petitioner himself has act acted unfairly if the party coming to the equity has acted themselves unfairly they cannot just come to equity and tell them that i have been punished for this reason and please uh, remove my punishment that cannot be done next coming to the public law within public law there are different categories that exist public law is basically a law that is for all the public living in a country for each and every person living in a country that is for those the law that are implemented are public law 
So there are different categories that exist in public law. The most important for us will be the private law, the, uh, sorry, civil law that we will be studying uh, after this topic. And when we come to private law, the private law is concerned with the, sorry, the public law main category of public law that we will be studying is the criminal law and then coming to the private law private law is concerned with the law enforced between individuals how individual behave with themselves how individual honor their contract how individual if there are talents in landlord how they are treating each other simply similarly goes for the property rights for the land law if someone is transferring his land to the other party where is everything being done according to the contract is everything being done according to the land law so basically whenever it it is the question of citizens behavior between citizens we will always be coming to private law when it is related to everyone in the country everyone in a society how they should act how they should be living it is always about public law so the only our emphasis in public law will be on the criminal law and our emphasis in this uh, private law will be on civil law as this subject has more has done uh, more emphasis on these two topics coming on the next slide there is a difference between criminal law and civil law as i told you criminal law is uh, is a category of public law and it is about each and everyone uh, and it is about each and every one person, each and every person living in a community. These are the laws that are implemented for each and every person living in a community and what they should be following. So coming to the definition of criminal law, criminal law relates to the conduct which the state disapproves and which it seeks to control. All those contexts which state disapproves, which state doesn't allow you to do, and which state wants to control, it is it comes in criminal law and as i told you criminal law is a part of is a form of public law coming to the purpose of criminal law the purpose of part, uh, the enforcement of particular forms of behavior by the state which acts to ensure compliance so there are particular form of behavior the state has enforced and they want each and every person living in a public in a community to comply with them Coming to the case, name of the cases, how a name of the case is brought in public law. In criminal, uh, in criminal law, the case is brought by the state in the name of Crown. A criminal name will be reported as Virginia versus the criminal name. Whoever, who, uh, the person who has done the crime, his name will be uh, on the last and the case will be brought to the court as Regina versus E. For example, if the person is any person, for example, if we look at Mark, for example, if a person is Mark and he has done any criminal activity in a country, his case will be brought to the courts with the name of Regina versus Mark, where Regina means the Latin for Queen. So basically, if living in any country, and especially UK, if you do any crime, that crime is against the state. So the case that will be brought to the court, that will be also from the state. So it will be like a state versus the criminal name. So in, in UK, the state is basically governed by the crown that is Latin queen. So it will be Rajana versus the criminal name. The party that brought the case, they have to provide all the proof. They have to provide all the uh, evidence that whether the other person is guilty or not. So burden of proof is on the prosecution. Prosecution is a party who has brought the case against the claimant. So in this case, the prosecution is state. In criminal law, the prosecution is state. So all the evidence, all the proof has to be provided by the state. Standard of proof guilt must be shown beyond reasonable doubt burden of proof is on the state on the prosecution standard of proof what kind of proof how much proof is required in order for judge to provide the verdict that is beyond reasonable doubt if the judge comes if the judge is giving a verdict on criminal law it must be he must be sure that there isn't any reasonable doubt left to give the verdict so if the evidence provided by the state is that much, 
that the judge is convinced or there is any and it is beyond reasonable doubt for the judge he will always give the verdict objective of criminal law to regulate society by the threat of punishment the main objective of criminal law is to regulate the society by threat of management if you follow basically the criminal law tells the people if you follow these certain type of acts you won't be punished but if you do not follow certain type of acts that are being enforced for the people living in a country you will be punished the objective of criminal law is also to reg is always to regulate society by the threat of punishment and coming to the remedies if found guilty in criminal law if the person who has committed the crime if it is proven that he has actually uh, committed the crime the court will always be giving the verdict as that person is guilty if court thinks that there is still reasonable doubt and he might have not committed the crime the court might give him the, the verdict of him being not guilty if found guilty the criminal court will sentence the accused and it may fine him or impose a period of imprisonment if innocent the accused will be acquitted so if the uh, after the hearing after all the proofs that is being presented by the prosecutor the judge thinks that or there is no reasonable doubt in the mind of judge that the person is guilty in that case he will impose punishment that can be in form of fine that can be in form of imprisonment but if judge if there is still a doubt in the mind of judge and he thinks that the proof that is being provided to me by the prosecution is not enough then he will acquit the person it means that the person is not guilty coming to the civil law definition of civil law as i told you it has been derived from private law so it is uh, in civil law is concerned with all the relationships that are between individual citizens so civil law is a form of private law and involves the relationship between individual citizens how individual citizens will be behave with each other how individual citizens should honor the contract with each other that all of these things comes under the civil law so purpose of civil law is to settle disputes between individuals and to provide remedies if there are any disputes between individuals civil law comes in action and provide remedies in uh, if we talk about the name of the case in civil law the case name of the case are brought by the names basically the person who will be uh, who will bring the case is the claimant his name his name will be the will be first and the person on which the case is being done is the defendant so in civil law the case is brought by claimant who is seeking a remedy the case will be referred to by the names of the parties involved in the dispute such as brown and smith brown versus smith in this case brown will be the claimant also known as plaintiff and in smith will be the defendant who will be defending himself in the case brown uh, has uh, the purpose of brown bringing the case will be to seek remedies for what smith has done wrong burden of proof is on the claimant the person who brings the case to the court all burden of proof all the proof has to be provided by that person standard of proof you don't have uh, to provide such standard of proof that there is no reasonable doubt left you only have to provide that much proof that you can show that the other person was liable for his action or the other person is liable for ex his action so liability must shown on the balance of probabilities so lower standard of proof in criminal law you require higher standard of proof in civil law you require lower standard of proof if you talk about objective of civil law usually financial compensation to put claimant in a position he would have been in had the wrong not occurred the objective of civil law is to put the claimant in a position he would have been had the wrong not occurred if the defendant hadn't done anything wrong the position the claimant would have been the purpose of civil law is to put claimant in that position coming to the remedies the civil court will order the defendant to pay damages or it may order some other remedy example specific performance or injunction so these are the remedies that are being awarded in the civil law so 
what we have started now till now we will perform some quest some questions relating to them the first question is which one of the following statement is correct the aim of criminal law is to regulate behavior within society by the threat of punishment b the aim of criminal law is to punish the offenders c the aim of criminal law is to provide means whereby injured person may obtain compensation and d the aim of the criminal law is to ensure that the aim of the criminal law is to ensure that sorry it's incomplete uh, might have not typed it fully let me repeat here uh, the aim of criminal law is to ensure that the will of the majority is imposed on is imposed on the minority so we have just studied the criminal law what definition suits the criminal law which, which definition suits criminal law the most is a that was the aim of criminal law is to regulate behavior within society by the threat of punishment as i told you people there will be certain type of actions that will be allowed to do and there are certain type of actions that are not allowed for the public to do so if the public are included or involved in the behavior or in the actions that law has prohibited them to do they will be treated according to the criminal law the aim of the criminal law is to regulate behavior within society by the threat of punishment coming to the next question which of the following is the prosecutor in a criminal law case prosecutor is the person who brings the case and as i told you people in criminal law it's the state that brings the case because if you commit a crime living in a country that crime is against the state so it will be the state who brings the case so it's the e option that is correct coming to the next question which of the following describe the standard of proof in a civil law So when we talked about the balance of proof, the balance of proof in criminal law is high. So basically, when you have to pro provide the proof, it must be beyond reasonable doubt. But that was in criminal law. In civil law, you only have to prove that the other person was liable, other person owe you, and he breached his liability. So the in civil law, the standard of proof is in case of balance of probabilities whether there is a other person owe you something or the, it was a liability of other person to perform such act and he breached his liability next question which type of law is concerned with the function and operation of local authorities so which type of law is concerned with the local authorities when we talk about the local authorities we are talking about the people living in a uh, in a community so which type of law is concerned with the function and operation of local authorities local authorities means that the, the authority that will be governing a community the authority where that will be looking for a community or people living in a community so whether it will be a there are four options whether it will be public law it will be private law it will be common law or it will be equity so the law that is mainly concerned with the authority local authority that is public law as we will be looking at whether the locals have been following the law properly or not <clears throat> so whether a society a local authority has been functioning and operationing properly it's all about public law coming to the next question which of the following types of legislation affects specific individuals or group so basically the legislation the law that affects specific individuals or group is a private law and private law is made for individuals 
and it affects specific kind of specific individuals or groups so these were the different types of law we started and on what are their definitions and how they are implemented on the people coming to the next english court systems what are the basic court systems that are in uk there are two types of court systems that are in uk either it is a civil court system or it is a uh, criminal court system first we will look at the civil court system in civil courts we will be going from bottom to top the first court that is magistrate court magistrate court basically the magistrate court is actually counted in criminal courts or actually comes in criminal courts but as it has some authority in civil cases that's why it is also included in civil courts but if the question comes in the exam whether magistrate court is part of criminal court or civil court mainly magistrate court is part of the criminal court it it is only included in the civil courts because it has some authority in civil claims and those civil claims can be family matters such as contact orders adoption and maintenance there are also powers of recovery of council tax areas and charges for water gas and electricity that is being described in the picture that you can see on the slide next the first court with all the first instance civil claims when we talk about the first instance it means where the hearing is first heard so every civil claim first hearing is heard in county court so first instance in civil claim is contract tort landlord and tenant tenant probate and insolvency so basically all the civil claims that come to the civil court they are first heard in the county court county court is the main civil court where all the civil claims or all first instance of civil claims are being heard there are two judges in county court one district judge hears small claims and one circuit judge that hears the fast track claims and multi track claims so if we talk about the three track system what is a three track system when a claim is received it will be allocated to one of the three tracks for the hearing when when a party brings a case against the other party when a party claims something from the other party whether it will be a small track claim whether it will be a fast track claim whether it will be a multi track claim it depends on the how much claim you are expecting from the other party so if we talk about the small claim track it deals with the simple claims valued at no more than pound 10000 and informal court so if we talk about the small track claims these are the simple claims and those values are not more than pound 10000 so if you bring a case to the county court and the value you are expecting from the defendant is pound 10000 or less then it will go go to the district judge in county court because the district judge has the small claim so he can give you a question like this so which are the claims that are being heard by the district judge and for that the answer will be the small claims similarly coming to the fast track claims deals with moderately valued claims of between pound 10000 and 25000 expect to last no more than one day so if you bring the case to the county court and you are expecting that the party or defendant to pay you between pound 10000 to 25000 it will be a fast track claim and in county court all the fast track claims are being heard by the county uh circuit judge the multi track claims deals with the claims of over pound 25000 or complex claims all the complex kind of cases all in in any case in which you are expecting more than pound 25000 to be claimed from the defendant that is known as a multi track claim and for multi track claim the case is being heard case is heard by a circuit judge in a county court so coming to the question in the civil law system sorry in the civil law system cases are allocated to one of the three tracks for processing which of the following is not a track in civil law system fast track is a track 
median track is not a track in three track system as we have started above there is a small track there is a fast track there is a multi track but there isn't any medium track then the next question which of the following courts have only civil jurisdiction have only civil jurisdiction means it can will only be handling civil claims or civil cases it does not have jurisdiction in criminal cases or any other cases so that is basically the county court the county court is a court that has all the expertise that has all the uh, jurisdiction of civil claims coming back to the civil courts the claims from magistrate court and county court and civil courts goes to the high court of justice where you can see in the diagram as well the county court claims can also be moved, can also be uh, sent to court of appeal talking about the high court of justice one high court judge in first instance there is only one high court judge who hears the claims first instance where the case is first heard and then there are total three divisions in high court in civil courts queen bench division hears first instance cases of contract and tort so all cases related to contract and tort will be heard by queen bench division similarly chancery division deals with all the other cases that are not related to contract and tort and that are also not related to any family cases so all the cases that are not related to contract tort or family matters are being heard by the chancery division so chancery division deals with the land law trust company law partnership law insolvency etc it hears appeal from county court on probate and insolvency coming to the family division family division hears all matrimonial cases matrimonial means all cases that are related to a family between husband and wife between any family members so if a case is coming from a single family in which there is disputes between family members that can that is heard in high court of justice by a family division so coming to the question queen bench division family and chancery division and all division of which courts so we just started that these are all divisions of high court queen bench division that only hears about case claims about contract and tort family division that hear claims about family matters and then coming to chancery division all the matters that are not related to tort contract or family matters that are being heard by the chancery division okay cases from high court of justice can be sent to the court of appeal so basically whenever you bring a case you take the case to high court of justice high court of justice gave its verdict and that verdict is not and you that's not suitable for you or you don't think of that verdict that is being justice or the justice is being done with you or whenever you think that the verdict that is given by the high court of justice is like an injustice that is done to me i expected more from a court and i'm not getting that much claim so you can appeal your case against in the, again in the higher courts so if you want to appeal a case from high court of justice to any higher courts there are two courts available either you can appeal your case in court of appeal or you can also take your case to the supreme court that is the superior court in uk so court of appeal court of appeal here claims from two courts also from high court of justice and also from county court so three lord justices of appeal here appeals from the high court and county court you cannot take a case directly to court of appeal or supreme court for a case for appeal to be heard in court of appeal or supreme court they should have been heard in first hand Uh, by county court or high court of justice so first the cases are being heard by high court of justice or county court then you can take your appeals to the court of appeal then comes the supreme court previously also known as house of lords as it, as i told about you court of appeal the cases cannot be directly brought to court of appeal 
first they should have been heard by in the lower courts like in high court of justice or court, county court case can, and also not be directly brought to supreme court first they should be heard in county court court of appeal or high court and then they can be brought to supreme court that was previously known as house of lords in 2007 the house of lords the name house of lords was changed to supreme court coming to the next question the chancery division of high court has cases involving which of the following matters so i told you people chancery division does not hear family matters chancery division does not hear contract and tort so every all the cases that are other than contract and family contract tort and family matters that are being heard by the chancery division so contract law contract law is being heard by the queen bench division trust and mortgages that are being heard by the chancery division then the next question which of the following is not a division of high court chancery division is a division of high court queen bench division is also a division of high court and then comes the supreme division that is not a division of the high court okay coming to the criminal courts We will be looking from bottom to the top. The very first criminal court is magistrate court. We, I also told you people in the civil courts as well. The main jurisdiction of magistrate court is in criminal cases. So magistrate court, court of first instance, court of first instance means all the criminal related cases will be first heard at the magistrate court. So once the hearing is done in the magistrate court, then it can go to the other courts so first we will talk about the magistrate court coast of first instance deals with the criminal cases in various ways so there are two ways in which magistrate court has a case in magistrate court basically the case the court uh, the case is being heard by the jury a magistrate not the jury if the question comes about the jury the court in which jury hears the case is the crown court the court of first instance deal with the criminal cases in various of ways summary offenses decides whether the defendant is guilty of the offense and imposes the penalties penalties are less in the magistrate court so basically the summary offense is heard in the magistrate court next comes the indictable offense where there is a tribal trial by jury whenever there is a trial by jury it won't be heard in a magistrate court that will goes to a, that will go to a crown court the so magistrates will conduct a committal proceedings to make sure the defendant has a case to answer so summary offenses that are heard in the magistrate court indictable offenses that are being heard by the crown court that is the next superior court that will be starting after the magistrate court offenses tribal either way here the defendant is given an option whether he wants to uh, uh, take the case to magistrate court where the magistrate will be hearing the case or he wants the jury to hear his case in which the case will be brought to crown court and the jury will be hearing the case so offenses tribal either way the defendant can choose whether to be tried in the magistrate court or to be tried in the crown court so if a defendant wants a summary offense the summary offense in which magistrate hears the co uh, case and imposes the penalty that will be heard in the that will be heard in the magistrate court or if the defendant wants the case to be heard by jury which will become indictable offense and indictable offenses are heard in the crown court presided over by either lay magistrates in magistrate court there are basically lay magistrates the bench usually consists of three lay magistrates and one district judge sitting alone appeals on question of the fact go to the crown court if there is question any questions about the facts of the cases that goes to the crown court and if there are any appeals on the cases that are going to, that are taken to the high court and in high court queen bench division if you look at this arrow the divisional court of queen bench division hear all the appeals from magistrate court on the related to all the 
can be made by the prosecution and defense and the case stated appeals on the questions of law all the questions that are related to the law whether law has been implemented successfully whether law has not been implemented successfully the case is brought to the divisional court of queen bench division coming to the crown court presided over by a judge whose role is to decide question of law and impose the punishment case will be heard before a jury whose role is to decide question of the fact that is whether defendant is guilty of the offense so in crown court the case is heard by a jury not by the claimant not by the magistrate and jury decides whether the person is guilty or not jury is basically any it's a panel of different people who are from different backgrounds they are selected randomly and they are brought to the court to hear the case about the defendant coming to the court of appeal the criminal division three lord justices of appeal hear appeals from the crown court same as it was in civil courts as well there are three lord justices of appeal who hear the appeal from the crown court and then coming to the supreme court supreme court is presided over with five lord justices who appear the uh, appeal from a court of appeal and exceptionally from high court in case of criminal courts uh harsher i did i haven't given the question answers here because i thought as people will be attending the webinar they have the option of selecting the answers but uh, for, uh, i will give the uh, list of answers to the uh, people who have uh, arranged this webinar and they will send you the answers after i've shared it with them coming to the question criminal law case begin in which of the following courts so we all know the first court that hears any first instance of criminal cases are the magistrate court magistrate court hears the first claims on any criminal cases question which of the following statements concerning cases brought before a magistrate court is correct so which statement concerning cases brought before a magistrate was correct the case is decided by mag magistrate rather than jury yes the jury is always in the crown court in magistrate court the case are heard by the magistrate and he decides on the verdict only criminal cases are heard at magistrate court magistrate court has some civil authority in family matters and also in recoveries so you cannot only say that is only related to the criminal cases appeals are made directly to the court of appeal the appeal cannot be directly made to the court of appeal from magistrate court magic the appeal from magistrate goes to the crown court or either to the queen bench division specifically from to high court and from crown court they can go to the court of appeal next question which of the following offenses would be only heard at a magistrate court which of the following offenses would be heard at a magistrate court so a summary offense is heard at a magistrate court indictable offense is heard by a jury that is in the crown court a tribal either way offense so basically in tribal either way offense it's the decision of the defendant whether he wants his case to be heard as a summary offense or an indictable offense so if he selects the summary offense that is heard at the magistrate court in case of indictable offenses those are heard at the crown court where a jury decides the case and the verdict <coughs> next question in the criminal law system an appeal regarding a decision by a magistrate court could be heard by which of the following courts so in a criminal law system an appeal regarding a decision by a magistrate court could be heard by which of the following courts which of the following courts says the appeals or a decision that are related to the magistrate court it doesn't go to county court county court is a civil court system civil court crown court yes the crown court has all the appeals that are from magistrate court coming to the other courts there are also some other courts that are in uk 
European Court of Justice. European Court of Justice deals with actions between the European Union institutions and the member states. Though, as we all know about the Brexit, and we don't know about the Brexit uh, after effects, so I don't think that the European Court of Justice will still be there as UK have pulled them out from the European Union. But that is, these are something that will be decided in the future. So European Court of Justice, European Court deals with the actions between the European Union institutions and the member states. All the institutions, all the member states that are part of the European Union, their matters are heard at the European Court of Justice. It is the ultimate authority on the interpretation of European law, whether European law has been implied effectively, has been applied effectively, whether everyone is following the principles of European law, that is determined by the European Court of Justice. So if any European Union member breaches a law, does not follow European law, the other member can, brought a case, can bring a case against him in the European Court of Justice. Cases are referred to the European Court of Justice by national courts. First, the hearing has to be heard at the national courts, and then, then the national courts refer the cases to the European Court of Justice. No appeal. Once the European Court of Justice has given the verdict, you cannot appeal it against. That will be the final verdict that is given by the European Court of Justice. There is no other court that is superior to European Court of Justice so that you can appeal it to over there so as so european court of justice is the ultimate authority on all the matters between european institutions and the members so whatever verdict it takes whatever verdict it gives that has to be implemented that has to be followed and you cannot appeal it again then there is european court of human rights the final court of appeal in relation to matters concerning human right act 1998 all the matters that are related to human rights are brought to European Court of Human Rights. Proceedings in the English court must have been exhausted before European Court of Human Rights will hear a case. Same as European Court of Justice, the cases are first heard by national courts and then they are referred to the European Court of Human Rights. And once the European Court of Human Rights has given a verdict, you cannot appeal them as it is the ultimate authority. Then coming to Judicial Committee of Privy Council, all the meetings, all the hearings related to Judicial Committee of Privy, of Privy Council are being heard at UK in Supreme Court. The highest court of appeal of a member of Commonwealth. Basically, there are different Commonwealth countries. Uh, if you Google it, you can find a list of Commonwealth countries. So, based, all the uh, if there is any kind of uh, differences or if there is any kind of conflict between Commonwealth countries, that has to be resolved the case will be brought to the Judicial Committee of Privy Councils. Here is both civil and criminal appeals. It also hears civil appeals and it also hears criminal appeals. The right to appeal to the Judicial Committee of Privy Council is regulated by the constitution and legislation of the particular country. Proceedings take place in the Supreme Court of the UK and same, no appeal. So. <clears throat> the right to appeal to Judicial Committee of Privy Council is regulated by the Constitution. If your country Constitution allows you that you can appeal anything matter related to Commonwealth country to Judicial Committee of Privy Council, that you, then you can take your case to Judicial Committee of Privy Council. And all the hearings, all the proceedings that are related to Judicial Committee of Privy Council and Commonwealth countries that are being heard by, that are being heard in Supreme Court of UK. And whatever the verdict that is being given by the Judicial Committee or Privy Council, you cannot challenge it again. So coming to the question, which of the following is the final appeal court of human right issues for living person in the UK? Every person living in the UK, what is the final court for human right issues, that is the European Court of Human Rights, as we started in the last topic, ECTHR. European Court of Human Rights deal with all the matters relating to Human Rights Act 1998. The next topic is doctrine of judicial precedence. Precedence is a system. In many countries, there are uh, constitutions according to which the laws are made in uk the system that is being followed is constitution as well as precedence so 
So basically in UK, mostly the precedents are being followed. All the decisions, all the verdicts that are being given by the court are on the basis of precedents. And what is the meaning of precedent is basically what has been happening in the past. What previously judges, what are the verdicts that have been given by the judges in previous cases? So the system adopted by judges of following the decisions in previous cases is called the doctrine of judicial precedent. So it is a system where judges follow their previous verdicts in giving their verdicts of current cases. Some precedents are binding, meaning they will must be followed in later cases. There are precedents that you must follow in later cases, and there those precedents will be binding precedents. Other are merely persuasive, means that judges have the option to follow it or not, but they are not bound by them. Judges are bound by binding precedents. Judges are not bound by persuasive precedents. The factors we should consider knowing whether a precedent is binding or persuasive, there are three factors in total. The hierarchy of the courts. Hierarchy basically is the distribution of authority. As we all know, the higher court will have the more authority, the lower court will have the lesser authority. So if a verdict is given by the first, always the case is brought to the lower court first, and then it goes to the higher court. So for example, if we bring a case to a county court, county court gives its verdict, and the defendant against appeal it, again appeals it in the higher court. Is higher court bound by the decision of the lower court? No. Higher court is never bound by the decision of the lower court. So if a verdict is given by a lower court, higher court can overrule it. The changing of a decision of a lower court is known as overruling. So basically, if a verdict is given by the lower court and higher court wants to change it, he will he can overrule the decision. He has the option of following the lower court decision and he also has the option of not following the lower court decision. So basically, when you have the option of following the decision or not, it mainly becomes a persuasive precedent. But for a lower court, the verdict of higher court becomes a binding precedent. If a higher court has taken a different verdict, the lower court has to follow it. And he has to change his own verdict to the verdict of the higher court. In that case, it will become the binding precedent. Then we have ratio decidendi and obiter dicta. If we talk about ratio decidendi, the ratio decidendi is the legal reason for the decision. So if there are different cases that are being brought to the judge and the legal reason of all the cases are the same, all the cases will be given the same verdict. If there has been a case in the past and there is a case that is brought to you today, the legal reason of both the cases is the same then you will be giving the same verdict as you gave in the previous case. That is the ratio decidendi. It is the legal reason for the decision. If the legal reason for the decision is the same, if you see a reason, legal reason, on the basis of which you gave a verdict in the past, and that legal reason is always also present in this case, then you will be giving the same verdict here as well. So legal reason of the case is the same. It forms ratio decidenda and it forms binding precedent. If you talk about obiter dicta, obiter dicta are not part of the statement, are not part of the ratio. These are the statements that are not part of the ratio. They may be statements made by judges, such as hypothetical situations or wide legal principles. So they are the assumptions, they are the hypothetical situations that can be described by the judges or by the lawyer but they are not part of the ratio because as they are not the actual events, they are the assumptions, they are the hypothesis, they are not part of the ratio and judges are not bound to follow them. They have the option to follow them and they don't have, and they cannot follow them if they don't want to, meaning that it will become a binding, it will become a persuasive precedent. So they should decide a legal reason forming the Binding precedent, obiter dicta are statements made during the cases. That statements can be true, that statements cannot be true. So it's your option whether you want to follow those statements or not, ultimately becoming the persuasive precedent.
and the third thing is material facts of the cases if material facts of the cases are the same the facts that uh, there are, have been two cases one that was brought to you in the past the facts of that case and the fact of the case that is brought to you today are the same then you have to give this they have to give the same verdict as well ultimately it will be a binding precedent but if the material facts of the cases are different what happened in the past or the case that happened in the past that the facts of those case and the case that is brought to you today the facts of today, the today's case are different they are not the same ultimately it will become a persuasive precedent you have the option to follow that verdict or not coming to the next question which of the following is a statement by a judge that is the basis for their decision and is so what becomes binding on future judges that is ratio decidenda these are the legal reason these are the statement that are made by the judges legal reason of the decision if i'm giving this decision the legal reason of this is, this decision is this and in future if judges want to give their verdict and their legal reason is the same they will be giving the same verdict so ultimately it becomes the binding precedent which of the following types of court next question which of the following types of court decision occurs when a court higher in the hierarchy overturns verdict of a lower court in the same case okay whenever a high court changes the decision of a lower court that process is known as reversing okay if the a option is correct reversing basically reversing decision is made when a case is appealed an overruling decision occurs when a superior court overturns the decision of a lower court in different case distinguishing occurs when a judges decides not to follow precedent in the case before them because the material facts of two cases are sufficiently different so if there are two cases their material facts are different that process and because of that judges give give the different verdict that process is known as distinguishing so if to, there are two different cases and judges give the different verdict higher court gave the different verdict and lower court had a different verdict that is known as overruling so overruling decision occurs when a superior court overturns the decision of a lower court in a different case not in the same case if it is the same case and a higher court changes the decision of a lower court it is known as reversing so in this case we are talking about the same case uh, the same case verdict that is being overturned by the higher court it is this process will be known as reversing coming to how laws are made in uk how the laws rules and regulations are made in uk how a bill is passed in uk so basically the main is parliament all laws in the uk are made as parliament parliament is sovereign parliament can make any type of law but it cannot take okay let me explain reversing and overruling again reversing occurs a reversing decision is made when a case is appealed for example same case is brought to the lower court and the same case is brought to the higher court the verdict of that case in lower court was different the verdict of that case in higher court was different so if the higher court changes its decision changes the decision of a lower court in the same case that is known as reversing lower court gave a different verdict higher court gives a different verdict of the same case the verdict of higher court will be applied and as higher court has changed the decision of the lower court this process will be reversing if it occurs in the same case if there are two different cases the verdict of uh, lower court is different and the verdict of higher court is different then it will be known as overruling so an overruling decision occurs when a superior court 
overturns the decision of a lower court in a different case. If a superior court overturns the decision of a lower court in the same case, that is reversing, and in case of different case, that is over ruling. So we were talking about the parliament. Parliament makes all the laws in the UK. Parliament is sovereign. It can make any law it wishes until and unless it is not against the EU, European Union law. So talking about the act of parliament, parliament consists of, there are three uh, houses in parliament, House of Lords, House of Commons and the Monarch. House of Lords is the upper part of the parliament. House of Commons is the lower part of the parliament. And the Monarch is basically the Queen or the Latin word for Queen. In order to become the act of parliament, a bill must go through the following stages. So if parliament makes uh, want to make any law, want to make a, want to pass any bill, it has to go through different stages. First reading the name of the bill and its proposal is read out. Uh, the name of the bill, the bill that anyone is trying to pass out and it's the name of the proposal. The person who wants this uh, bill to pass out, his name is read out. Second reading, debates take place on the principles of the bill and it is then voted upon. So <clears throat> when the bill is proposed, each and every person in the uh, parliament debates on that bill, whether they like something about the bill, whether they don't like something about the bill, whether anything should be changed about the bill, whether things should be kept same about the bill that are being uh, that is a, there is a debate that is done on that and it is on the second reading and after that it is voted upon whether changes on anything is required or not so about the changes there is always voting if there are maximum votes who are asking for a bill to be changed or for certain principles of bill to be changed then they will be changed then comes the committee stage the committee stage comes in the second reading a smaller number of MPs, MP stands for members of parliaments, consider the wording of the bill. The state can last several months depending on the contentious of the bill. So whatever the votes that, whatever the changes that were decided will have to take place in the bill. Committees, there is a committee whose purpose is to bring those changes to the bill. So in committee stage, there are different member parliaments whose work is to alter that bill according to the votings, according to the debates that occurred in the second reading and then coming to the report stage the bill is amended by the committee and is reported back to the full house once the bill is successfully amended it is reported back to the full house that is the parliament and in third reading the bill is read for the final time and finally the bill is read after being after all the amendments are being done so once the bill is read out for the final time it still is not implemented in UK until and unless it gets the royal assent. So at the end of the, this process in both houses, the bill must receive the royal assent. He get the assent of the queen. So if the royal assent is given to the bill, then it will be immediately implemented. But as we have uh, studied about the piecemeal system, the bill in UK is also implemented in a piecemeal way. It is not implemented in the whole country at the same time. It is implemented in a country from areas to areas on a piecemeal basis. So for a bill to become an act of parliament, it must receive a royal assent. Without royal assent, that bill cannot become the act of parliament. Coming to the question, which of the following is not one of the stage for creating act of parliament? So which stage does not, is in a, we didn't study about which stage while forming a bill. Third reading, yes, there is a third reading. There is no fourth reading. In third reading, the bill is announced for the final time. The bill is read for the final time. And after that, it gets the royal assent. There is no fourth reading. And coming to the third option, there is a committee stage as well. Coming to the next topic, aids to interpretation. There are times when judges have to face ambiguous words or difficult words while giving the verdicts or while understanding the case. 
so what are the aids what are the modes to which the judges can help can take help to interpret any ambiguous words or different difficult words there are diff different aids to interpretation for that so these are all other aids that are being used by the judges to give meanings to the ambiguous words or difficult words or the words which has more than one meanings and you want to know which meaning should be used in this context in the context of this case the judges can use the aids to interpretation so aids to interpretation are the legislation itself what legislation means the law what is the definition of that law does that word comes in the definition and what meaning is taken of that word in the definition section so legislation means the definition of the law if that word is used in the definition of the law then you can get to know what meaning is being taken of that word in the definition section next is judicial precedents whenever we talk about precedents we are talking about the previous cases so if that word has uh, if an ambiguous word has come in the previous cases what meaning has been taken of them in the previous cases and the same meaning will be taken in the current and future cases as well the interpretation act interpretation act this act defines certain terms frequently found in legislation so basically interpretation act in interpretation act it is a uh, it is a list of words and meanings those words that have occurred in the past and those uh, words that have been ambiguous or that have been difficult for judges to interpret they have been recorded in the interpretation act along with their meanings that can help judges to select which meanings to give to those words to the ambiguous words to act define certain terms frequently found in legislation those words that are frequently used and every time that those words are used judges face some problems in giving meanings to them in that case there is an interpretation act and in interpretation act there has been a list made of those words along with their meanings so whenever judges face such kind of words they can ambiguous words are any words that are that come in any cases for example there comes a word in any case there are facts of the cases and the facts of the cases are such that the or the facts of the cases are consist of some words and judges cannot uh, identify what meaning those words should be given those are ambiguous words so basically ambiguous words are any words that has more than one meaning or those that are difficult words or about which judge cannot understand in which context we should use this meanings those are ambiguous words so ambiguous words can come in the material facts of the cases ambiguous words can come in the uh, from any lawyers if lawyers are obviously fighting for a case or if any lawyer is uh, representing claimant or defendant and he uses such words judge has to know in which context he is using such words and what should be the meaning assigned to those words next is hansard hansard or parliament's debate sorry oxford uh, Eng english dictionary obviously whenever we want to know the meaning of any word we don't know we always look up to the dictionary next aid to interpretation is hansard in hansard it's the parliament's debate we have to, talked about the act of parliament there was a debate stage the second reading in which debates were taken about in which debates were held about the bill so all the bills that all the debates that are being heard at the parliament that occurred in the parliament are being recorded and those are known as hansard so if there is an ambiguous word related to any bill related to any law you can go to parliament debates and you can see in which context this word was used in which context this word has been used in the definition and then you can assign the same meaning to that word sources of european union law european union uk joined in european union in 1972 and after that they can look at european union law if such words are used in european union law what are the context of those words 
and then in last human rights act 1998 human rights act you can also see the definition of human rights act if any such words are present there in human rights act what are the meanings that are being assigned to those words coming to the question which of the following is an intrinsic aid to statutory interpretation what is intrinsic and what is extrinsic intrinsic means the bill is made in the parliament all the information that is present to you in the parliament from the parliament inside that is intrinsic and the information that you gather from external sources that is not from inside the parliament that is extrinsic so if we are talking about which of the following is an intrinsic aid to statutory interpretation so what are the sources that were present inside the parliament and you took help from them and took the and uh, gave the meaning to this ambiguous words so intrinsic statutory interpretation answered answered are the debates of the parliament they are present in the parliament they are taken from debates occurred inside the parliament so it is an intrinsic source intrinsic aid to statutory interpretation okay so we were at the question which of the following is an intrinsic aid to in statutory interpretation intrinsic aid are all those aids intrinsic aids are all those aids that are from inside the parliament so <clears throat> first if we talk about the answered okay all those which are part of the act all those which are part uh, which becomes the part of the act which becomes a part of the bill are the intrinsic pay to statutory interpretation debates of the parliament can become the part of the act debates of the parliament cannot become the part of the act so answered basically is not an intrinsic aid to statutory interpretation answered is an extrinsic aid to statutory interpretation as it does not become part of the Act. These are just the debates that occur during the parliament that occur in the parliament. Those debates can become the part of the act. Those debates cannot become the part of the act. Coming to the long title of the act, the long title of the act is the intrinsic aid to statutory interpretation, as the long title is an element of the act and is therefore an intrinsic aid. Basically, the, the what act you want to pass, what bill you want to pass, its title will become the uh, part of the act so the long title of the act is an intrinsic aid to statutory interpretation yes intrinsic aid to statutory interpretation uh, is long title of the act answer is not because answers are debates a answer law and commission reports are not part of the act and therefore are intrinsic aids they are not part of the act and therefore they are intrinsic aid the long title of the act is are is the intrinsic aid to statutory interpretation next question a parliamentary bill becomes an act of parliament when it passes through the committee stage in committee stage basically the, the law is amended according to the altered according to the debates on receiving its third reading in third reading the name of the uh, basically the final reading of the bill is done it still doesn't become the bill of the act when passed by both houses of parliament 
even if the both houses of the parliament has passed a bill it does not become the act of the parliament on receiving the royal assent yes when a part has when a uh, act has received a royal assent when a bill has received a royal assent it becomes the act of the parliament so d option is the correct coming to the rules of statutory interpretation we have uh, started about the aids to statutory interpretation the aids that judges use to give meaning to ambiguous words how meaning will be given to ambiguous words and which rules will be followed by the judges in giving meaning to the ambiguous words those are these four rules literal rule golden rule mischief rule and purposive rule these rules are used and according to these rules judges assign meaning to ambiguous words so first we talk about the literal rule and literal rule words must words must be given their ordinary dictionary meaning meantime even if this produces an undesirable outcome so when judges when judges assign their literal dictionary ordinary dictionary meaning their literal meaning to the word that is the literal rule so in literal rule words must be given their ordinary dictionary meaning even if this produces an undesirable outcome so first when there is an ambiguous word judge always apply the literal rule first if literal rule gives an absurd meaning if the literal goes the rule gives an undesirable outcome then judges goes to the golden rule talking about the golden rule where the literal rule gives more than one meaning or provides an absurd result when the ordinary dictionary meanings assigned by the judges give an undesirable outcome an absurd result the judge will go to the golden rule and according to golden rule the golden rule is used to ensure that preference is given to the meaning that does not result in a provision being an absurdity so basically according to the golden rule if a word has different meaning that meaning will be assigned that gives a meaning that gives a meaningful context to the word and does not give any absurdity or undesirable outcome so if you for apply the literal rule you will be giving the ordinary dictionary meaning even if it gives an absurd result but if you do not want to to follow the absurd result you will go for golden rule and according to golden rule that meaning will be assigned to the words that does not give an undesirable outcome that fits to the context that is according to the context of the words coming to the mischief rule used to interpret a statute in which in a way which provides a remedy for the mischief of the statute was enacted to prevent if we talk about the mischief mischief is something that statute does not want does statute want to prevent statute does not want it to happen so according to the mischief rule it is used to interpret a statute in way which provides a remedy for the mischief if the, you are prohibited from doing something and you still do it according to mischief rule you will be provided a remedy the other the innocent party or the party that has suffered because of you not following the uh, interpretation or not following or not doing what statute asks you to do then according to mischief rule you will be given the remedy innocent party will be given the remedy so mischief rule is basically the rule that is implemented to prevent the mischiefs and if a mischief has happened according to mischief rule the innocent party will be given the remedies and coming to the purposive rule this is a modern approach here the court is not just looking to see what the gap was in the old law it is making a decision as to what they felt parliament meant to achieve so purposive rule we look at the purpose of the bill if a parliament has implemented an act what was the main purpose of that act if that the purpose of that act is being implemented and the purpose of that act is being followed then the other party will not have to pay any damages or any remedy but if you are not following the purpose or if the purpose of the act that parliament implemented is not being followed is not being implemented the way you are doing things the purpose of the act is not being implemented correctly or is not being getting fulfilled then according to purposive rule you have to pay the 
damages or you have to pay the remedy so this is a more modern approach here we just see what was the purpose of the act that was implemented by the parliament and if that purpose is being fulfilled by any party in any way they are doing that in any way they are doing the work according to purpose of rule you won't be held liable but the purpose of the act is not being fulfilled by anyone then according to purpose of rule you will be liable Coming to the questions, which rule of statutory interpretation states that word in a statute should be given their plain ordinary meaning unless the word, unless this would give rise to a manifest absurdity or inconsistency with the rest of the statute? So which rule of statutory interpretation states that word in statute should be given their plain ordinary meaning <clears throat> unless this would give rise to manifest absurdity? If it gives rise to absurdity, then it won't be given their ordinary dictionary meaning. But if this gives, if does not give rise to absurdity, then it will be given their ordinary dictionary meaning. So basically, if we talk about the golden rule, in golden rule, the words are given their uh, the meaning that fit the context that uh, is according to the context. So A option is the correct. In golden rule, the words uh, are given the meanings that fit them the most, that fit the context. Coming to the next question, what does the literal rule of statutory interpretation means? Words should be given their ordinary meanings. Next, the meaning of the words can be gathered from their context. Words should be given the meaning which is likely to give effect to the purpose of reform which the statute intended. Words should be given their ordinary grammatical meanings unless the meaning is manifestly absurd. So basically, A option is correct. Words should be given their ordinary meaning. In literal rule, words are given their ordinary meaning even if it gives, even if it gives an undesirable outcome. <clears throat> Coming to the next question, which of the following is an example of purposive approach to the statutory interpretation? So, if we, when we talked about the purposive rule, a, the courts want to see that whether the purpose has act has been fulfilled or not the purpose <clears throat> because of which an act was made whether that is being fulfilled or not that is what we see in the purposive rule so if the, the question is what is which of the following is an example of purposive rule purposive approach to the statutory interpretation so in purposive approach we see whether the purpose of being the context is being fulfilled or not the purpose that uh, parliament wanted to uh, achieve by enabling an act by forming an act by forming a bill whether that is being achieved or not so that is the definition of purposive rule so if the question comes which of the following is an example of the purposive appro approach To a statutory interpretation so basically it's like the giving uh, that meaning to a word that fit the context or giving meaning to a word that fit the context that fulfills the purpose of the context so that is always the golden rule because in golden rule that meaning is assigned to the word that fit the context and that is a does not provide any absurdity And the last question, well, that because we have studied that question, that question is again being written here. Which of the following types of court decision occurs when a court high, higher in the hierarchy overturns the verdict of a lower court in the same case? So when a higher court <clears throat> overturn verdict of a lower court in the same case, that is reversing. When a higher court overturns the verdict of a lower court in a different case, that is overruling. So basically there here the option will be reversing because the high court has overturned the verdict of a lower court in the same case.
so this was the chapter number one we have started all the base uh, important topics of this chapter and we have covered uh, mcqs with them as well we will take a 10 minutes break and after that we will start chapter number two contract law so we will start the class after 10 minutes
welcome back students we started with chapter number one we have started and looked at all the important topics that was of chapter number one and along with the practice questions coming to the chapter number two which is the most important question of this subject at for business law approximately 30 to 40 percent of your paper minimum 30 percent of your paper comes from the contract law there are mcqs that are related to the contract law there are mtqs one mtq always comes from the contract law so this is the chapter you should always read in detail and read in depth before attempting the or before uh, booking the exam for f4 so we will also be looking at chapter number two contract law in detail as it is the most important chapter and we will be performing as much question as we can about the contract law <clears throat> talking about the essential elements of the contract law there are five important elements essential elements that should be present in the contract valid contract if you want a contract between two parties to be valid if you want to see whether a contract that is made by two parties is it a valid contract of or not these five elements should be present in a contract number one that is agreement offer and acceptance agreement is always done when one party makes an offer another party may gives acceptance to that offer next it is consideration consideration are the promises towards your contract by the both parties we will study this thing in detail so when there are when there is a contract between two parties there will always be consideration by the both parties towards the contract there will be a consideration of services by one party and the other party will be paying for those services as it will be their consideration next will be the intention to create legal relations whenever two parties enter into in a contract their intention is always to create a legal relation their relation in a contract will always be legal and legal relation is something that is monitored by the law capacity only those parties can enter into a contract who are capable of entering into a contract whether you want to see a party is capable of entering into a contract or not so for that purpose we'll see we see whether the person is not under the age of 18 or a minor only a person above 18 can enter in a contract person of should be of sound mind and not under the influence of alcohol or any pressure of entering into a contract so if a person is above 18 he's sound minded he's not in the influence under, under the influence of alcohol or any other drugs or he is not under the pressure of any person to enter into a contract then that person has the capacity to enter into a contract next is the legality only those contracts are valid that are legal illegal contracts are never valid what are illegal contracts for example if you make a contract to kill someone to murder someone to kidnap someone that is an illegal contract and that is no that does not follow the principle of legality so therefore according to the valid contract and that uh, according to the elements of the contract that contract will not be a valid contract <clears throat> form of the contract as a general rule a contract can be in any form written is, is written form oral form or by conduct normally the simple contracts are always in written or oral form can be in written form as well can be in oral form as well or <clears throat> can be by conduct of the other parties by what does the by conduct means for example if you tell other party that if you are at the office at 8 a.m in the morning next day it means that you have become my employee and you have accepted the offer so if the other party comes to the office at 8 a.m in the morning it means they have accepted the offer by the conduct so by conduct means if a party asks you to do something and if you do that something it means you have accepted the offer that is acceptance by conduct or contract by conduct exceptions some contract must be made in particular form such as in writing or they will be void there are some contracts that should be in writing form these include bills of exchange checks and transfer of shares in company contract for the sale of land must also be in writing so there are some kinds of contract that should always be in form of writing 
and these <clears throat> these contracts will not be made orally or by conduct then there are speciality contracts conveyances of land by conveyances we mean transfer transfer of land and leases for three years or more must be by deed these are known as speciality contract such contracts must be in writing signed witnessed and delivered that is intended to take effect the limitation period of the contract made by deed is 12 years for all other contract the limitation period is six years what does limitation period means if the contract breaches a simple so there is a simple contract between two parties and one party does not fulfill its obligations and breaches the contract the innocent party has six years to claim the damages or to take the case to the court in speciality contract the innocent party has 12 years if any one party does not fulfill its contractual obligation or breaches the contract coming to the question the vast majority of contracts are simple what is the meaning of word simple in this contract the term of contracts are set out in writing the contract does not need to be in particular form to be binding the contract contains fewer than the 10 provisions the contract is not supported by countries consideration so b option is the correct the contract does not need to be in any particular form to be binding it can be in oral form it can be not written form or it can be in uh, by conduct in special in simple contract next question which of the following contracts must be in form of deed in form of deed basically conveyances of land or lease a transfer of land or lease so basically a convince a option is the correct a convince contract the transfer of land or lease should always be in written form or must be in form of deed coming to the offer an offer is a definite and unequivocal statement of willingness to be bound in specific times specific terms without further negotiations so offer is a definite and unequivocal statement definite which does not which will not uh, which does not which will not change in the future and unequivocal where there is no doubt in that statement and you are giving that statement without any doubt so when you put some terms in front of other party and you tell them i will not be changing these terms and there is no doubt in these terms i'm sure about these terms if you agree to these terms you can give me your acceptance if you do not agree with these terms you cannot give your acceptance that statement of terms is known as offer an offer can be in any form it can be in oral written or by contact however it is not effective until it has been communicated to the offeree there are always two parties offer is a party who makes an offer offer is a party who listens to the offer and decides whether to accept the offer or not so if a offeree does not know about the offer they cannot claim the awards under the offer for example if a reward is offered to for the return of a lost item it cannot be claimed by someone who did not know of the reward before they returned the item so if a person does not know about the reward for the return of lost item when they return it they cannot claim the rewards under it because they didn't know about the offer what is not an offer invitation to treat is not an offer what is invitation to treat when you invite other party to make you an offer that is invitation to treat so invitation to treat is not an offer examples are mostly advertisements so in any advertisement if the there are further negotiations intended or expected by the offerer by the party who are who is posting the advertisement that comes an invitation to treat but if there is an advertisement where there is no further negotiation intended or expected then off then it is offer then it is not invitation to treat so normally all advertisements are taken as invitation to treat but if there is any advertisement in which there is no further negotiations intended or expected then the offer will then that advertisement will become an offer shop windows display these are not offer these are invitation to treat because you are displaying goods on the shell windows and you are inviting other party to come and select any one of those items and make you an offer goods on shop shelves that is also an 
uh, invitation to trade you select items on the shop shelves you take them to the counter and then you offer to the person sitting on the counter that you want to buy these things tender also an invitation to treat auction is also an invitation to treat uh last question one minute okay the last question one was which one of the which of the following contracts must be in form of deed so any contract that is for the transfer of land or leases must be in form of deed conveyances means transfer so any contract that is for the transfer of land or lease also known as conveyances of land or lease must be in form of deed so the basically he is asking you which of the contract should be in form of deed which of the contract must be in form of uh, which should be done in the form of deed so whenever you contract with other party for the transfer of land or lease by transfer we also means a conveyance that is always in form of deed so a option will be correct okay coming back what is not an, what is not an offer a mere statement of selling price conveyance means transfer conveyance the word conveyance means transfer conveyance of land means transfer of land conveyance of liens lease means transfer of lease so the word conveyance means transfer so whenever you want to transfer a land or lease to another party the contract will be of conveyance of land or lease and that should always be in form of deed okay coming back what to a may statement what is not an offer a may statement of selling price in response to a request for information is not an offer if you ask about information related to any uh, any item it does not mean you are making an amen offer for example a friend is selling a car and you have asked about the de details of this car uh, details of the car or about the price of the car so you are asking of price you are asking of details should not be treated as uh, offer they are just a they are just a mere statement for of you to gather information if you go to a supermarket and pick some product which has a selling price decided and customer cannot bargain is it offer or invitation to treat it is still an offer because after selecting you cannot bargain about the price but whether the seller will allow you to buy that product or not that can only happen when you have asked the buyer if i can buy this product or not so that is still an invitation to treat you will select that item you will go to the counter and you will ask the counter person i want to buy this product so basically you are making him an offer after that it's his decision whether he wants to sell that product to you or not so it will still be an invitation to treat okay similarly a may statement of intention to sell is not an offer if you tell someone that you have intention of selling a product or item it does not mean necessarily you are making him an offer that is not an offer that is still invitation to treat uh, sorry that is still not an offer it is just you are telling your intention to someone coming to the question in relation to the contract law which of the following describes an offer a statement of possible terms 
displaying goods for sale in supermarket a verbal promise to be bound on specific terms so a verbal promise to be bound on specific terms as offer can be in for orally in written form or can be in form of but conduct so c option is the correct a verbal promise to be bound in specific terms is an offer coming to the next question which of the following is an example of a valid offer which one will be a valid offer a display of goods for sale that is invitation to treat not an offer an internet shop that advertises products for sale that is still an invitation to treat a newspaper advert that includes a specific statement made to them the world at large offering a reward for the return of a particular item and d an invitation for potential suppliers to tender for the provision of services so c option is the correct as i told you people advertisements are mostly invitation to trade but they, if there is an advertisement in which there is no further negotiations intended then that becomes an offer so in c option he is telling you a newspaper advert that includes a specific statement made to the world at large offering a reward for the return of a particular item it means any person who fulfills there is an offer for everyone whoever fulfills this offer he will be rewarded and there is no further negotiations and there is no further uh, communication intended to happen a display of goods in a shop will generally constitute to invitation to treat a display of goods in a shop is invitation to treat because the seller is inviting you to select anything from the shop and then make him an offer that you want to buy this product so it is an invitation to treat which of the following is not an essential element of a valid simple contract the contract must be in writing the parties must be in agreement each party must provide a consideration so the contract must be in writing that is not an essential element because the contract can be in oral form in written form and in form of uh or by contact as well termination of offer once a party has made an offer to the other person can he terminate can that offer can uh, can he finished or can he terminate that offer so basically once an offer has been terminated it cannot be accepted an offer can be terminated by there are three ways in which an offer can be terminated number 1 revocation number 2 rejection number 3 lapse talking about the revocation revocation by the offerer can be made at any time before acceptance even if the offerer has agreed to keep the offer open so revocation basically if a person has made an offer other party hasn't given acceptance the person can still end the offer and if a rev offer is ended before the other party has given an acceptance that is known as revocation so the revocation must be communicated to the offerer that is it must be brought to his actual notice if you finished an offer if you made an offer to a party and now you have revocated that offer it must be communicated to the offeree because if offeree accepts it before knowing about the revocation that will still be a valid contract but the revocation can be communicated by the offerer or a reliable third party the offerer can himself uh, the revocation can be communicated by the offerer or a reliable third party offer can be revoked but cannot be changed yes for it, if you want to change an offer first you have to revoke, revoke the original offer and then you have to make a new offer in that way a offer can only be changed first you have to revoke it by revoking the original offer will end and then you make him a new offer with all the changes you want there are two exceptions to revocation if the offeree pays the offerer to keep the offer open any revocation will amount to breach of the collateral contract if you make an offer to a party 
and that party pays you to keep the offer open for a certain amount of time then you cannot re revocate the offer until that time has passed for example i made an offer to a someone he gave me 100 dollars and asked me to keep the offer open for 7 days i cannot if i accepted the 100 dollars i cannot revoke the offer for 7 days it will keep it will be open for 7 days and if i revoke the offer within 7 days it means i have breached the contract i have to pay the damages the offeree could claim damages for the loss of the opportunity to accept the offer although he could not accept the offer itself in second exception in the case of unilateral or optional contract what is a unilateral or optional contract in which the other party does not have to give you acceptance by uh, orally or in written form they can give you option acceptance by conduct if a party gives you an acceptance by conduct it means they have accepted the offer for example you give you give an offer to a party and you tell them there are different options for you to accept this offer and if you perform any one of these options it means you have accepted the offer so that is a unilateral optional contract which is mostly uh, in which mostly the acceptance is being given by the conduct so looking at the case of Arrington versus Arrington, a father offered to transfer his house to his son if the son paid the mortgage. A father offered his son to pay the mortgage of the house, and if the son began to pay the begin to pay the mortgage of the house, the father will transfer the land to his son's name. The son began to pay the mortgage, but when the father died, his personal representative wanted to withdraw the offer. The son began to pay the mortgage. And when the father died, the personal representative of the father wanted to revoke the offer as son has not given any acceptance in oral form or in written form. So the court decided once the son has started to pay the mortgage, it means he has accepted the offer and that is a unilateral or optional contract where acceptance is made by your conduct. So once the uh, son started to pay the mortgage it means he has accepted the offer by conduct by optional as he has fulfilled the option the father gave it to him so that was an acceptance and the contract was made once the acceptance is done when, when once the acceptance is being given the offer cannot be revocated rejection the second way in which offer can be uh, terminated is rejection Rejection by the offeree means may be outright or by means of a counter offer. The counter offer in which is also known as a bargain. If you want to bargain on the price of any item, it means you are counter offering him. For example, you go to a shop, you ask about the price of a product. The shopkeeper tells you it cost all of 100 and you replied uh, in return of his offer that I want to buy it for dollar 80. So the bargain you want to do is a counter offer and once the original offer uh, once the counter offer is uh, revocated once the counter offer is rejected original offer is also rejected so rejection by the offering may be outright or by means of a counter offer a counter offer is an offer made in response to an offer if a party makes you an offer and you reply with a counter offer and the other party rejects the counter offer so with the rejection of counter offer the original offer is also rejected you cannot go back to your original offer and accept that because it is also rejected by the rejection of counter offer note that a mere request for further details does not constitute a counter offer for example if a person asks you further details of any product they are selling it does not mean they are making a counter offer they are just asking for further information about a product for example a person is selling his car and i go to him and I ask him what are the specifications of this car? What is the feature? What are the features of this car? It does not mean I'm making a counter offer. It only means I'm asking for the information about the product he is selling. Counter offer is an offer on the offer. Once a, party you have, once a party has made you an offer, for example, a party tells you that I'm selling the, a product for $500. Do you want to buy it or not? And I tell him, I will only buy this product if you sell it for $400. So by telling 
your offer in response of an offer is a counter offer once a counter offer is rejected the original offer is automatically gets rejected for example a person who wants to sell me an item for dollar 500 i make an offer about the same product for dollar 400 he rejects the counter offer of dollar 400 it means the original offer of dollar 500 is also rejected i cannot go back to him and tell him okay i will buy this product for dollar 500 please give it to me for dollar 500 he can also reject that so once a counter offer is rejected uh, original offer is also rejected <coughs> coming to the laps the last th way in which an offer can be terminated is laps an offer will lapse on the death of the offer the person who made an offer uh, has died and the offer hasn't given acceptance yet so before the uh, acceptance of the offer is given and the offer dies it means the offer has lapsed and that offer cannot be accepted the death of the offeree the person to whom you made an offer he didn't accept it and before accepting it he died it also means the offer has lapsed the failure of a condition where a condition was given as we started in errington versus errington the previous case in which father asked his son to pay the mortgage if the son didn't pay the mortgage it means he has failed the condition he has failed the option it means the offer has automatically lapsed and after the expiry of a fixed term for example you made an offer to a party you have made an offer to the offeree the offeree didn't reply for you for a reasonable time and they come to you after a an year and say that now we are accepting the offer it means the off fix expire the fixed time has expired and after the fixed time has expired the offer automatically expires <clears throat> so what is the reasonable time it depend on the subject matter of the contract what is the reasonable time in which an offer should be accepted it always depends on the subject matter of the contract and all the judge always decides what's the reasonable time in which a contract should be in the which an offer should be accepted coming to the questions what is the legal effect of the following statement in a newspaper for sale computer monitor and laser printer good condition pound 500 the statement is offer for sale the statement is made buff or boost the statement has no legal effect the statement is an invitation to treat so basically the person has given a statement that computer monitor and laser or printer or for uh, are for sale they are in good condition and are for pound 500 but he has not stated that he will give it to the any person who makes an offer or he will give it to any person who comes to buy it so basically it is an invitation to treat the people will come they will select the computer monitor or laser printer they want to buy and they will go to the person who has invited them to make an offer they will make him an offer that we want to buy it so basically it is an invitation to treat if he would have written if he would have written computer monitor and laser printer are for sale good condition pound 500 any person who comes to the shop and selects the item i will sell it to him so basically it means there are no further uh, negotiations or no further communication intended then it would have been an offer for sale but here mere puff or a boost is just something that uh, he wanted to boost his business he wanted to uh, uh, enhance his business that's why he is giving such statements in the newspapers so uh, so basically may puff or boost boost is just a way in which you want to boost your business or in a way in which you want to attract your customer in which you want to attract the customers to come to your shop that is may puff or boost so basically this statement is an invitation to treat because you have written certain amounts are uh, are for sale and in good condition for pound 500 but you have not written anywhere that any person coming to the shop and selecting such items i will sell it to them so basically it means that after accepting selecting these products there will still be negotiation between the buyer and the seller so this is an invitation to treat <clears throat> which of the following will terminate an offer next question which of the following will terminate an offer posting a letter of revocation a request for the information death of the offeree so basically death of the offeree will terminate an 
offer. Posting a letter of revocation also terminates an offer, but it depends whether the letter was posted after it was accepted or after or before it was accepted. So basically, he has not communicated clear, uh, clearly, he has not stated clearly whether a posting of letter of revocation was before the acceptance or after the acceptance. That's why we cannot determine whether it will uh, terminate an offer or not. A request for further information does not constitute an offer. So if it is not information, it cannot terminate an offer as well. And death of the offeree, posting a letter must be received for revocation. Yes, posting a letter should be before the acceptance and it must be received before the acceptance is given. That's how a letter of revocation can terminate an offer. And debt of the offeree, obviously the person to whom you have made the offer, if he dies before accepting it, it means the offer is automatically revocated, terminated. <clears throat> Paul has just agreed to sell a piece of land to his friend Martin. Which of the following statement is correct? The contract is not enforceable. That is an agreement between friends. For the contract to be enforceable, it can be in any form. For the contract to be enforceable, the terms must be set out in writing. For the contract to be enforceable, Paul and Martin must be over 21 years old. So basically, Paul has just agreed to sell a piece of land. Whenever you want to sell a land, the contract should be in writing. If you want a contract to be valid, it must be in writing. So C option is the correct. For the contract to be enforceable, the terms must be set in writing. Because I've told you before, there are some contracts that should be in writing that are transfer of shares, transfer of land, conveyances of land, and conveyances of leases. Next question. In contract law, once an offer has been terminated, it cannot be accepted. Which of the following does not terminate an offer? Yes, transfer of shares as well. Because in these slides on the very second page, uh, it was the list was given <clears throat> which uh, offer should be in terms of writing, which contract should be in terms of writing, and which can in term of which can be orally in form of oral oral form. Next question, in contract law, once an offer has been terminated, it cannot be accepted. Which of the following does not terminate an offer? A request for further information does not terminate an offer. Revocation by the offerer thus terminates an offer. Lapse by reasonable time thus terminates an offer. And rejection by the offeree thus terminates an offer. So a request for further information does not terminate an offer because it is not a, an offer, counter offer. It is just you are asking for further information. Coming to the acceptance, acceptance is unqualified and unconditional assent to all terms of the offer. Of the offer, if the offer has made you an offer and you agree to all the terms of the offer without any conditions, without any qualifications, it means you are giving acceptance to the offer. Acceptance can be in oral form, in written form, and by conduct. The offerer can stipulate a particular mode of acceptance. However, if he merely requests a mode, the offer is still not limited to that mode. The offerer can ask for any mode of acceptance. He can ask you to give acceptance by uh, written in written form or by in oral form or by conduct as well. Uh, however, if he requests a mode, but you are but the offer is not limited to that mode. Offer can select any mode they want fit. They uh, see fit for themselves. So, as a general rule. Acceptance is not effective until it is communicated to the offer. Obviously, if an offer has made key, has made you an offer and you have accepted that offer, for that offer acceptance to be effective, it must be communicated to the offer. The person who has made you the offer, you should inform him that I have accepted your offer. So acceptance must for an acceptance to be effective, it must be communicated. Then there comes a Talex rules. What is a Talex? It is a machine on which you can send fax or in which you can uh, record your uh, telecommunication which, which you can record your answer uh, any messages when the other person is not uh, receiving the your call so telex rule if a fax telex or telephone message is received during normal business hours then it is when it is communicated even though it might not be read until later 
so for example if the office timings are from 9 a.m to 6 p.m and italics comes at 2 p.m so the person who has to receive that italics does not hear it it is not important for this purpose the acceptance will be effective at the time the italics was received during working hours so as the italics was received at 2 p.m at that time the acceptance will be effective Similarly, if a fax, telex, or telephone message is received outside normal business hours, it is deemed to be communicated when the business next business next opens. So, for example, if the office timings are from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. and you receive a telex at 7 p.m., acceptance is not communicated on that day. Acceptance will be communicated the next day the business starts at 9 a.m. So, you should know about such rules about telex. then there is an acceptance <clears throat> then there is another uh, another thing you should know about acceptance silence cannot be stipulated as acceptance so for example if you make an offer to another party and that party does not give you a reply does not say anything in return it does not mean they have accepted your offer on an acceptance to be made effective it must be communicated to the offer so silence cannot be stipulated as acceptance we had a case of felthouse versus bindley and this case is also in your notebooks as well uh, <clears throat> there was a uncle who's wanting who wanted to buy a horse from his nephew and he asked him if he does not give him a reply it means the horse will be his for pound 30. Bindley didn't give the reply but later he did not give the horse as well as saying that i didn't give you an acceptance the acceptance was not communicated and it was not a contract and court said the same thing that silence cannot be stipulated as acceptance if bindley has not communicated that he want to sell his horse to you or he has accepted your offer of pound 30 until then it means he has not accepted the offer then comes the postal rule which is very important the postal rule is bit different from the other rules according to postal rule an acceptance is effective when the letter is posted there is no need of communication in postal rule as soon as the letter of acceptance is posted it means you have accepted the offer however the postal rule only applies if the letter is properly stamped addressed and posted and the post is reasonable method of communication it applies even if the letter is never received by the offerer so for the postal rule acceptance is communicated acceptance is effective the time the letter was posted the letter should be properly stamped addressed and posted and postal rule can only be used when there are no other modes of communication when there are no other effective modes of communication and even if you have posted the letter which was properly stamped addressed and the offer never received it still the offer was still the letter uh, still the acceptance was effective effective Coming to the questions, which of the following statement regarding postal rule is correct? Acceptance is effective once the lesser letter of acceptance is written. Acceptance is effective once the letter of acceptance is posted. Yes, acceptance is effective once the letter of acceptance is posted. Question, which of the following is not a valid method of acceptance? The offer is expressed words, the offer is conduct, or silence of the offer. Silence of the offer is not a valid method of acceptance. If you want uh, to communicate the acceptance it either should be by conduct or by express words next question stephen posted a letter of acceptance to martin on 3rd december on the 5th december martin emailed stephen to withdraw the offer on the 6th december martin received a stephen's letter of acceptance which of the following statement best describe the situation There is no contract. Martin has successfully revoked his offer by email prior to acceptance. There is no contract. Acceptance is writing in writing is not a valid form of acceptance. The contract, there is a contract on 3rd December and there is a contract on 6th December.
so basically Stephen posted a letter of acceptance to Martin on 3rd December on 3rd December a letter of acceptance was written posted so basically the once the letter of acceptance is posted the fact acceptance mm -hmm. is being communicated the acceptance is effective so basically there was a contract on 3rd December coming to the next part consideration consideration is an act or forbearance forbearance means the promise of it on the part of one party to a contract as the price of promise made to him by the other party to the contract so basically whenever there is a contract between two parties both parties have made uh, promises towards the contract uh one minute yes key term is posted in postal rule once the letter of acceptance is posted it means the acceptance is communicated it does not matter whether the acceptance was uh, the letter of acceptance was communicated was received by the offer or not so the basically the letter of acceptance was posted on 3rd december it means on 3rd december the acceptance was effective and the offer was being and the contract was being made offer cannot be terminated because the termination letter was posted after the letter of acceptance once the letter of acceptance is posted on 3rd december the offer is accepted the contract is made the uh, letter of revocation was posted on 5th it was 5th i think yes on the 5th december martin emailed Stephen to withdraw the offer so basically the offer of rev the letter, uh, revocation was posted on 5th but the acceptance was made on 3rd december the soon the letter of acceptance was posted so once the letter of acceptance is posted on 3rd december the acceptance is effective after that revocation does not matter Once the offer, when the acceptance is done through the post, the day the letter is posted, the contract is made. Any revocation done after that date will not be valid. The contract is made on the day acceptance is posted. So basically, talking about the consideration, consideration are exchange of promises. When there is a contract between two parties, there is always consideration by the both parties one party consideration is will be to provide products or services another party consideration will be to pay uh, for the products and services so the promises to uh, towards the contract by the both parties are the consideration there are two types of consideration as sorry there are different types of consideration executory consideration is given where there is an exchange of promises to do something in the future for example two parties had a contract today and both will exchange their promises in the future you have been for example you have been hired in an organ hired by an organization they made a contract with you on 1st of may and they asked you to join the organization on 31st on the 1st of june so basically the contract was made on 1st of may but the exchange of promises will be on 1st of june that will be executory consideration executed consideration means that the consideration is in form of an act carried out on the time the contract is made if the acts are carried out at the time of the contract then that is executed consideration so basically you go to a shop to buy some item you select an item you make an offer to the seller and the seller accepts it you get the item you, and the seller gets the payment this is a executed consideration because this was done at the time of the contract for a consideration to be valid it must be sufficient but need not to be adequate what does sufficient means for a consideration to be sufficient it must fulfill two things there must be some monetary value attached to the consideration if any consideration is uh, if there is a monetary value attached to any consideration it means it will be a sufficient consideration it does not depend whether that monetary value is less or 
not so for example if i'm teaching in a university and they charge me and they pay me by hour and they are paying me only one rupee per hour or one dollar per hour so it does not matter whether i'm uh, provide giving more effort and i'm being paying less until and unless there is a monetary value attached to the consideration it will be a sufficient consideration what does adequate means adequate means it does it is not important for both parties consideration to be equal in amount so equality means adequate <clears throat> so it can never be judged whether the consideration are adequate or not or it can never be judged whether the both parties are paying the uh, both parties consideration towards the contract is of same amount or not that's why they say a consideration does not need to be adequate but it needs to be sufficient and by sufficient he means there must be a, some monetary value attached to the consideration and it must be incapable in law of amounting to the consideration coming to the past consideration past consideration is insufficient and therefore is not valid what is a past consideration consideration is past if the consideration is an act which has been performed before the other party gives his promise if you do something for some other party and then you go to another party does not have the knowledge of it and then you go to the other party and ask them that i have done this work for you now you have to pay me for that as the other party does not have any knowledge about what you were doing they are not liable to pay you for anything as it is a past consideration so if basically if it is if one party does something for you and you have no knowledge about it that other party is doing something for you and the other day other party comes to you and asks you for payment you are not liable to pay them because that is a past consideration coming to the questions which of the following is executed consideration so executed consideration is one where the exchange of promises on the is on the day of the contract so providing goods in return for payment at the same time a promise for payment a promise to pay work no providing goods in return for the payment at the same time is the executed consideration next question which of the following describes how courts deal with adequacy of consideration court will seek to ensure that consideration from each party is of equal value no court can never look to see whether the consideration from each party is of equal value that's why they say consideration does not need to be adequate it needs to be sufficient court will seek to ensure no property may, no pro, pro, party, party makes excess profits or court will not interfere in a contract to rectify a bad bargain so basically c option is correct court never interact uh, interfere in a contract to rectify a bad bargain because the bargaining power is always with the parties who are entering in a contract so if a party makes a bad bargain he cannot go to the court and says i made a bad bargain please uh, make this situation right for me the court cannot do anything how you will bargain in a contract that all depends on you so you have to be a good bargainer if you want to enter in a contract because court will not help you once you made a bad bargain coming to the next question which of the following is the correct rule of valid consideration consideration must pass from the promise consideration must be adequate past consideration is generally valid consideration executory consideration is generally not a valid consideration so so basically consideration must pass from the promise that is a valid rule for valid consideration next question which of the following statement is correct executory consideration is a consideration yet to be provided executory consideration is consideration yet to be provided so both are the same things sorry the other option should be wrong they get not to be provided basically executory consideration is consideration that is insufficient in the eyes of the law so basically executory consideration is a consideration yet to be provided a option is correct the b option will be like executory consideration is consideration yet not to be provided so basically executory consideration where is exchange of promises is today but you have to uh, provide the consideration in the future next topic is privity of contract privity of contract means parties to a contract the general rule only the parties to a contract acquire rights and obligations under it 
two parties who are in a contract only they have the rights and obligations under the contract only they can sue and can be sued on it but there are general exceptions in which the contract is between two parties and the third party can interfere or can sue the other two parties or any one of the other two parties for example the contracts exception number one the contracts rights of the third parties if two parties make a contract to provide rights to the third parties to provide benefits for the third party and in any case second last second last was which of the following is a correct rule for valid consideration consideration must pass from the promise a option is correct <clears throat> because b says consideration must be adequate consideration need must be sufficient not adequate past consideration is generally a valid consideration past consideration is never a valid consideration executory consideration is generally not a valid consideration executory consideration is generally a valid consideration so a option is correct correct consideration must be must pass from the promise so we were on the exceptions of privity of contract under the rules of land law restrictive covenants run with the land to which they relate what are restrictive covenants for example <clears throat> if restrictive covenants are agreement an agreement that restricts any party to build something on the land for example if i have a land and the other party makes an agreement with me that you can never construct anything on this land this will be a restrictive covenant so even if i sell the land in the future their covenant will run with the land it means the next party to whom the land will be sold they also cannot build anything on that land because of the restrictive covenants so covenants are the agreement so if there is an agreement on the land even if you sell the land in the future the agreement will run with the land insurance law allows a third party to take the benefit of a contract of insurance for example there is a there's a thing called life insurance in which you go to an insurance uh, company and you tell them you want to make a life insurance in any case if you die during the time of the insurance all the benefits from the insurance should go to a next of kin basically it can be your father it can be your mother it can be your wife or brother or sister so basically if the insurance in any case if you die an insurance company does not pay the benefits to the third party the third party can bring a case against the insurance company similarly the same goes for trust law the trust law uh, concept is not that familiar in pakistan but in many other countries there is a trust law concept where the parents pay money to the trust and they tell the trust when our child is of a certain age you can give this money to the child so basically the contract is between the parents and the trust but it is for the benefit of the their child so if in any case the trust does not uh, pay the child after their certain age after they have reached a certain age the child can bring the case against the trust next agency law allows an agent to make a contract between his principal and a third party we all know that agent can make a contract between a principal and a third party so basically agent can affect the contract where uh, and the contract was between the principal and the third party and similarly an executor can enforce contracts made by the deceased for whom he is acting basically it comes in inheritance if a person has written his inheritance that i want my assets to be distributed within my family in such percentages and such ratios the executor can enforce that contract and distribute according to the will so they, these are some cases in which other than the parties to a contract parties to a contract can affect the contract so question coming to the question which of the following statements concerning privity of contract is con correct privity of contract means only one party to a contract may sue on it both parties to a contract can sue on it privity of contract is not subject to regulation by statute it is subject to regulation by statute there are no exceptions to the rule of privity of contract there are exceptions of to privity of contract Privity of contract is only enforceable on commercial contracts. Privity of contract is not 
uh, only enforceable commercial can be enforceable on domestic let me confirm that yes privity of contract is only enforceable on social ag uh, commercial agreements because we will study in future that the domestic and uh, social agreements are not legally binding so privity of contract is only enforceable on commercial agreements they are not enforceable on uh, social and domestic agreements coming to the next question the doctrine of privity of contract means that a contract is not legally binding if it is a private agreement no only the parties to a contract can enforce it yes only the parties to a contract can enforce it the term of a contract are primarily the concern of the parties to it the ambiguity in the contract will be interpreted against the party trying to avoid liability so basically b option is correct only the parties to a contract can enforce the contract and acquire rights and obligations and under it next is terms and representations Privity while MCQ ka A option Q nahi. Uh, which one? First MCQ or second MCQ? First one. Pri privity of contract means only a party to a contract may sue on it. Because we have read about the exceptions as well. In there are some exceptions in which a contract is between two parties, but a third party can sue on it. Similarly, uh, going for the second question the second question was about the doctrine of privity of contract means a contract is not legally binding if it is a private agreement only the parties to a contract can enforce it yes only a parties to a contract can enforce the contract can enforce the contract but there are uh, uh, times the exceptions where third party can sue on the contract if any one of the parties is not fulfilling the contract Okay, coming to terms and representation, a statement written or oral made during the negotiations leading to a contract may be term of the contract or may be a representation include inducing the contract. Uh, yes, I think so. The session is being recorded and uh, you can contact the uh, organizes they will provide you with the recording so coming back to the terms and representations <clears throat> a statement made written or statement written or oral made during the negotiations leading to a contract it can uh, terms and representation can be all the terms that are made during the negotiations those terms can become the term of the contract and those can become the representation of the contract so a representation is something that is said by the offer to induce the offeree to enter into the contract. It may or may not become a term of the contract. Whether a representation becomes term of the contract or not, it all depends how important is the term for the, or how important is the representation for the offeree. If the offeree is entering into the contract because of that representation, it, it will become the term. But if the representation is not that important for the offeree, then it will not be the term of the contract. It will be merely representation. The distinction between terms and representation is important because it, if a statement is untrue, the remedies available to the innocent party differ. Why it is important for a term for us to decide whether a term is uh, whether a statement is term or representation? <clears throat> because if a term is not fulfilled then the innocent party can discharge the contract and sue for damages both but if a rep, uh, term is, if a statement is representation and that is not fulfilled then innocent party can only sue for misrepresentation so the statement made during the contract 
can be term or representation whether that statement is term or representation it all depends on the importance of that term importance of that statement if that statement is important for the offer it will become the offer it will become the term if that statement is not that important for the offer then it will become the representation sources of terms the terms of contract can be expressed express means contained in contract written or oral or they can be implied implied terms can be by statute by law by the courts to give business efficacy to implement the party's presumed intentions and by customs and usage so basically the source of terms from where the terms will be included in the contract they can be expressed they can be in written or oral form or they can be implied implied means by statute by the courts and by customs and usage implied terms are those terms which are not expressed in the contract but the parties entering into a contract should know about them because of their position <clears throat> when you are in a contract you are in a position that because of which you can uh, you should know about the implied terms express terms are the terms that are expressed in the contract implied terms are the terms that are not expressed in the contract but due to your position in the contract you should know about these terms for example there is never written in a contract that if you breach the contract you will be you have to pay remedies so basically it is an implied term because when i enter into a contract i should know that i should not breach the contract if i will breach the contract i have to pay the remedies i have to pay the damages types of terms <clears throat> there are three types of terms conditions important term going to the root of the contract the main purpose of the contract the main thing because of which you entered into the contract is the condition of the contract then there are warranties warranties are less important terms incidental to the main purpose of the contract they are less important terms and they are incidental to the main purpose of the contract as it is not the main purpose of because of which you entered in the contract but but they are important enough but they are uh, they should be provided once you want to fulfill the uh, main purpose of the contract so they are less important term incidental if you want to perform the main purpose of the contract these are the things you have to perform first but they are less important than the main purpose of the contract which will be the condition of the contract <clears throat> similarly in nominate term <clears throat> in nominate term is a term where that is neither a condition nor a warranty or in which the parties cannot uh decide whether it is a term or a whether it is a condition or a warranty efficacy the business efficacy the business efficacy means the ability to produce a desired or intended result to ability to perform in a satisfactory way that you uh, achieve the result that you desire that is business efficacy so basically the terms implied terms are those terms that uh, implied terms are implied by the courts it means you should fulfill the terms of the contracts in such a way that the purpose of the contract is fulfilled so if the purpose of the contract is fulfilled by the way you have handled the terms it means your it means that you have achieved the efficacy so in nominate terms neither a condition or a warranty in which you cannot decide whether it is a condition or a warranty the distinction between the type of term is important because it determines the remedies that may be available in the event of breach it, the <clears throat> remedies are same as of the terms and representation if condition is not fulfilled you can <clears throat> discharge the contract and you can also sue for damages but if a warranty is not fulfilled you cannot discharge the contract but you can sue for damages <clears throat> in case of in nominate terms where you cannot decide whether it's a condition or a warranty the court will decide whether that term was a condition or a warranty and that will be decided on the basis of consequence on the basis of consequences if the term consequences if the consequences of that term not being fulfilled are serious then that term will become a condition and in that case you can discharge the contract and sue for damages as well and in any case the in nominate terms not being fulfilled 
the consequences of it is not serious it's trivial then it becomes a warranty and in case of warranty <coughs> you cannot discharge the contract <coughs> but you can uh, basically sue for damages coming to the question which of the following statements regarding implied term is correct Which of the following statements regarding implied term is correct? Terms may be implied in the contrary by in the contract by statute. Yes, terms are implied in the contract by statute. We know that express terms are written and oral. There, there are three ways in which contract terms are implied. It can be by statute, it can be by courts, and it can be by customs in usage. The courts do not interfere in contracts by implying terms. Yes, courts uh, court does interfere because there are terms implied by the courts. And if you do not fulfill the terms that are implied by the courts, then court will interfere. Terms implied in contracts by custom may not be overridden by express terms to the contrary. Yes, they cannot be overridden by the express terms. So basically, terms may be implied by the contract by the statute. Terms are implied by the contract in the contract by the statute. Coming to the next question, which of the following actions can a party take where a term of a contract proves untrue? Terms is an important, uh, basically, statement of the contract. And if the term is not fulfilled, yes, there can be MCQ which have two answers, but he will specifically say, uh, say in those questions which two of the options are correct and which two of the options are not correct. So whether there will there are two options to the answer, he will specifically say that which two of the options are not correct, which two of the options are correct, or which two of the options are not correct. Coming to the next question, which of the following actions can a party take where a term of a contract proves untrue? Sue for breach of contract, sue for misrepresentation, and sue for a wrongful contract. So if a term of a contract is not fulfilled, you can sue the other party for the breach of contract. A option is the correct. Coming to the next question. In relation to contract law, which of the following describes a warranty? A term vital to the contract that if breached entitles the injured party to treat the contract as discharged. No, warranty is not important, uh, vital to the contract. It is incidental to the contract. So the option is not correct. A term subsidiary to the main purpose of the contract that if breach entitles the injured party to claim damages, yes, it is incidental to main of part of the contract. If vanity is not fulfilled, the other party can sue for damages. Next question. An in nominee term is one that could either be classified as a condition or a warranty. How is this classification of an in nominee term as a condition or a warranty that determined? So basically, uh, whether an uh, in nominee term is a condition or a warranty, it depends on the consequences of the, the term not being fulfilled. So if the consequences are serious, that will be considered as a term, as a condition. If the consequences are trivial, then that will be considered as a warranty. And normally courts decide it whether uh, in nominee term will be decided as a condition or a warranty. So B, C option will be correct by the courts. Question, how are express terms incorporated into a contract by decision of the courts, by statute law, by the parties themselves? Yes, by the parties themselves. Both parties who are entering into a contract, they, at the time of negotiation, they will be determining the terms of the contract. So basically the parties to the contract determine the express terms because express terms are the terms that are expressed at the time of the contract or when the contract is made.
coming to the exclusion clause next topic what is an exclusion clause an exclusion clause or an exemption clause is a term that seeks to exclude or limit a party's liability for a breach of contract it is a con uh, clause which is incorporated into a contract by one party so in case of in case if they breach the contract they can uh, uh, limit their liability or they can exclude their liability so in case a party breaches a contract they and they have entered the exclusion clause in the contract they might not have to pay any uh, damages or remedies so for an exclusion clause to be valid it must satisfy two rules uh, before starting uh, let us go through an example of exclusion clause for example if you go to any cinema where there is parking parking tickets and the person who gives you a ticket uh, you give the person money and he gives you a ticket and on the back of the ticket it is written in case of uh, lost or stolen in case if your uh, car gets lost or stolen the management will not be responsible so basically that is an exclusion clause because in case if your car gets stolen they have excluded their liability so in case the contract gets breached for if because of this thing because of this clause that they have entered in a contract they will not be responsible for that so for an exclusion clause to be valid it has to follow two rules first we will study about common law rules then we will study about statutory rules talking about the common law rules in order to be uh, in order to be valid an exclusion clause must satisfy two conditions it must be incorporated into the contract by signature notice or previous dealings first for an exclusion clause to be valid it must be incorporated into a contract exclusion clause can be incorporated into a contract by three things signature if you have uh, signed the contract and an, in that contract the exclusion clause was present it means that exclusion clause is incorporated into a contract secondly notice but for the notice you should know that notice is basically anything that is written on the board normally you go to a shop you buy something and on the counter there is a notice written that uh, no refunds or no exchanges that is a an exclusion clause because in any case if the product is not right or is not up to the quality you expected you cannot return or exchange the product but for notice you should know that a notice should be placed at the time of the contract at the place of the contract where the contract is made if uh, for example if you go to a hotel in hotel the contract is made at the counter but if there is any exclusion clause that are on the notice and that notice is placed in your hotel room those notice will not be uh, incorporated are not incorporated into a contract because the notice was not present in at the place of contract so for all the notices they should be placed at the uh, should place of contract and same goes for previous dealings if there are two parties who have been in uh, contract for who have been dealing with each other for a long time for four years five years six years one party who initially when they started dealing one party used to give other party a document uh, stating all the exclusion clause the other party used to sign at first but after some time he told the other party that please do not give me the exclusion clause notice because i already know what you want me to sign and what you don't want me to sign i already know about it so there is no need for uh, you to give me the exclusion clause so basically you uh, asked him not to give you an exclusion clause it does not mean the exclusion clause will not be incorporated into a contract it will be incorporated into a contract due to previous dealings so for an exclusion clause to be valid under common law rules it must be uh, incorporated into a contract and other second important thing it was things must cover the loss wording must cover the loss means the wording of exclusion clause should be clear intel intelligible so the person relying on the clause should know which liability or which breach of contract liabilities are being excluded so under the contra profentum rule the courts interpret the words narrowly against the interest of the person seeking to rely on the clause so the wording of the clause should be as such that the both parties should know the party relying on the clause should know that which uh, breaches of contract here which breach of liability they are specifically talking about 
in what case they won't be uh, held liable in what case their liability will be excluded or breached so the wording of the exclusion clause should be uh, such that the wording must cover the loss uh, that's it students for today uh, we will complete the, the remaining of this chapter tomorrow along with the chapter number three and four that will be our target for the number two for basically day number two uh, if you have any questions or anything you can write it down with yourself and ask me tomorrow before the class so we can go through the questions and then we will start the next topic the next day and uh, for now that will be that's it for today uh, i'll meet you tomorrow at the same time for the and we will continue further from exclusion clause statutory rules.